children or neighbors who have children and would like to come and be part of that wonderful Saturday morning, feel free to do that. Um, Jed, is any instructions, anything you need to know at this point? No, just come on out, join us for a wonderful celebration. It's coming Saturday morning, 10, 10, 10, 10 till about 11 30. We'd, we'd love to have you. Also, we would, would encourage you to mark your calendars for our Tenebrae service. That takes place on Good Friday, which is April 3rd, 7 o'clock, right here. It is going to be a very creative, interactive, non-threatening <laughs> way for you to come and remember the events of Good Friday. I, I say this all the time. Um, we cannot appreciate the joy of Easter until we understand the passion that takes place on, on Good Friday. So mark your calendar. We'll be talking about a 45-minute service. 7 until about 7.45, 8 o'clock, right in here. Mark your calendars and plan on doing this. Are there other announcements that need to be lifted up today that anyone's aware of? No? All right. Scripture says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before our friends come. Let us worship.
morning. Let us pray. Good morning, God. You are our God. Amidst the calamities of this world, here we are again to worship you, to love you, to give you praise and thanks for being the great I am. Thank you for the abundant rain to wash away the winter snow and ice. Thank you for children who in innocence tell us that God is bowling when it thunders and the big boom is Papa making a strike. Thank you for babies that coo, smile, and have conversations with you, reminding us of the ever-present spirit that comforts and helps us. Thank you for bumps and bruises that remind us of our frailty and that God's healing is precious patience. Thank you for the transitions in life that take us from birth to death and a life everlasting. Thank you for new friends. We welcome into the faith and family of God. Thank you for people who boldly step up and say, here I am, use me. Thank you for the continued faithfulness of those who give selflessly and serve people who are in need of care. Thank you for the rays of sunshine that brush bronze the face of our pastor and our snowbirds, showing that seasons change. We thank you for all our blessings, big and small. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 42. And you can find it in your Pew Bible on page 424. 42 is a little close to the front for the Psalms, because they're in the middle of the Bible, not the front. Psalm 42 is one of the uh, contemplative Psalms. And as Kimberly taught us last week with the children, a Psalm is like a song or a prayer. And so listen today for this reading, which comes from the voice, which may sound a little bit different than what you read in your Bible. But let's listen to God's word for us this morning. My soul is dry and thirsts for you, true God, as a deer thirsts for water. I long for the true God who lives. When can I stand before him and feel his comfort? Right now, I'm overwhelmed by my sorrow and pain. I can't stop feasting on my tears. People crowd around me and say, where is your true God, whom you claim will save? With a broken heart, I remember times before. When I was with your people, those were the better days. I used to lead them happily into, the, into God's house. Singing with joy, shouting thanksgivings with abandon, joining the congregation in the celebration. Why am I so overwrought? Why am I so disturbed? Why can't I just hope in God? Despite all my emotions, I will believe and praise the one who saves me and is my life. My God, my soul is so traumatized. The only help is remembering you wherever I may be. From the land of the Jordan to Hermon's high place to Mount Mazar. In the roar of your waterfalls, ancient depths surge, calling out to the deep. All your waves break over me. Am I drowning? Yet in the light of day, the eternal shows me his love. When night settles in and all is dark, he keeps me company. His soothing song, a prayerful melody to the true God of my life. Even still, I will say to the true God, my rock and strength, why have you forgotten me? Why must I live my life so depressed, crying endlessly, while my enemies have the upper hand? My enemies taunt me. 
They shatter my soul the way a a sword shatters a man's bones. They keep taunting me all day long. Where is he, your true God? Why am I so overwrought? Why am I so disturbed? Why can't I just hope in God? Despite all my emotions, I will believe and praise the one who saves me, my God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
At this time, I'd like to invite the boys and girls down front for the children's sermon, please. Come on down, you guys. So I'm wondering if you guys have had any jelly beans yet. You have, did you wait till Easter to get jelly beans? Yeah? I've already started buying them. And I have an older son who lives at home with us. He's a big boy. And whenever I put them out, he eats them all. And I never get any. So what I've decided to do is I just put like half the bag out. And then I take the bag and I hide it somewhere and wait till those are all gone so that I can get some. And then I put the rest of the bag in the dish so that everybody gets some. There's plenty of jelly beans, but sometimes he just eats them all and I don't get any. I was thinking about that this week because there's a story in the Bible that's kind of like that. Have you ever heard the story of the loaves and the fish? Yeah, can you, can you tell it quickly to us? What's it about? Exactly. Have you guys heard that story before? You've heard the story about the loaves and the fishes. The people were hungry and they all needed to eat. And the disciples of Jesus, they were kind of afraid that there wasn't going to be enough food. But Jesus said, there's plenty of food. We just need to learn to share it. And so I, I, I think it started with a little boy, actually. I think it started with a little boy who was really nice and he took out his lunch and he said, I'll be glad to share my lunch. And when people saw him doing that, everyone else started sharing their lunch too. And before you knew it, there was enough bread and enough fish for everyone to eat. In fact, there was so much food that they, was it 12 back? Is it 12? I don't even, they what? With bread, they picked up 12 extra baskets of bread and fish because there was so much. So it's all about sharing, learning to share. And again, this year during Lent, we want you guys to start sharing some of the things that you have. Remember our, our fish boxes? I'm gonna give every one of you a fish box and you can take it back to your seat and maybe have mom or dad help you put it together. And what you're supposed to do is share Share by every, do we want to say every day, maybe every, every week? Try to put some of your loose coins in here. And then on Easter, actually we should do every week or every day. Because you have so many coins. Okay, don't put them all in on the first day. Space them out. We've got three more weeks until Easter. You want to fill these up with coins, bring them back to church, and we are going to use all of that money to share with the people around us who don't have it. Okay? So, yeah. You have two biggie bags. Okay. You have two too. Can you take maybe just some of the coins from them and put them in your fish fish box? I don't I don't know mine You don't. I bet your mom or dad do. They can probably help you. You have two. Okay, is there stuff in it? Have you put any money in it yet? No? Oh, good. Good. Well, let's see if we can fill up these boxes, okay? Let me pray, and then um, when you guys go back to your seats, I will, um, I'll give you one, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for all that you have given us. Help us. God, help us to be like that little boy in the Bible that shared his lunch. Help us to share our money, our coins, with people who don't have any. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say, amen. Okay, there you go.
Charlotte Grace didn't take a box because she said her piggy bank doesn't have a hole. She doesn't know how to get anything out of it. So if you want to pick one up afterward, feel free. <laughs> Listen now, again, to the word of God as it comes to us from the 14th chapter of Mark's Gospel, verses 12 through 16. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus said to his disciples, where do you want us to go and make preparation for Passover? So Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room, upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out, and went to the city and found everything as Jesus had told them, and they prepared for the Passover meal. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. Well, when it comes to the last week, Jesus' final days on earth, the church's focus has primarily been on the end of that last week. But the Gospel of Mark takes us through the entire seven-day period, offering important teaching that takes place at the beginning of that last week as well. Jesus' message, if you've been following along, Jesus' message on Monday was about not substituting worship in the house of God for justice in the land of God. Tuesday's message was about prayer, centering prayer, that doesn't so much change our circumstances as it changes us in our circumstances. Wednesday's message was about the inevitability of Jesus' death and our offering him either extravagant praise and love as did the woman with the jar of expensive perfume that Frank preached about last week, or withholding our trust. Because like Judas, we don't see Jesus measuring up to our standards of what we believe a real Messiah should be like. Wednesday is about that choice. This morning, on Thursday, Our journey toward the cross continues. And today we find ourselves at a table where Jesus and his disciples are having their final meal together on what is known as Maundy Thursday. Now, as I pointed out two weeks ago, in Mark's telling of the events of this very important week, Jesus is well aware of his faith, at least He has to have some kind of inkling about what is going to happen to him. He knew what lie ahead. And so the apparent secrecy of the Passover preparation is probably because he's still got more he wants to teach his followers. He's still got more to give to the disciples. His work was not quite done. And so his gathering with his friends in what Mark describes as Jesus' last celebration of the Passover feast, it seems to be the perfect setting for one of Jesus' final lessons, one that we still lift up today through what we call the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The invitation to take, to eat, to drink, is all about our participation in the entire process of death and resurrection. Our communion table reminds us again and again, do this in remembrance of me. And what we're being called to do in remembrance of Jesus is participate in the entire process of death 
and resurrection. And that is so critically important for us. Marcus Borg and Dominic Crossan, in the book many of you are reading, says that the Lord's Supper is about participation with Christ and not substitution by Christ. And that is important for us to consider this morning. Our participation in the sacrament of the table is a reminder to all of us of what our lives should be like. It's about the realization that we are called, every one of us, to die over and over so that we might experience newness of life again and again. The sacrament is less about Jesus doing something for us, serving as some kind of substitute for us, and more about his setting for us an example of what we are to do for others, a revealing of how we are to participate in God's work in this world. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that we can either choose to bring about death to the ways of God, or we can further those ways. It's a reminder that our sin, our failing to love and care for the people around us, the world in which we live, our unwillingness to forgive or to extend mercy and grace and love to those around us, our, our choices to be silent when we are called to speak up, our call to listen carefully to that still, small voice calling each of us to further the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. All of this, all of this sin crucifies Christ again and again. It puts to death all that Jesus came to offer the world and give death victory. But death need not have the victory. Death need not have the final say, and our choices will determine how we will answer that question. The death that we see all around us need not be given the power to reign, unchallenged and unrestrained. Now, you might think, of course, we know this, Bob. Nothing new here. But think about it for a moment. I would contend that many of us have been raised and taught to understand Jesus and his death as being more about substitution than this kind of participation. Many of us have been raised to think about Jesus as taking our place making faith simply about accepting and believing Jesus doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. But this morning, I want to challenge that passive approach to faith. Because in my mind, it mutes Christ's real witness in the world, and it hinders our ability to become the radical change agents that we've been empowered by God's Spirit to become. What Jesus inaugurates at the Last Supper is a great and mighty revolution of people, instructed, fed, nourished to become servants of this world, giving ourselves away just as Jesus did for a better world. It's not, it's not a revolution carried out by one supernatural God-man, Jesus, at some point in the past, but rather it is a revolution equipping a mighty army of God. People like you and me, empowered by the Spirit to walk in God's ways, embracing light and life here and now. Most of us, far too many of us, have been raised to talk about communion and Easter 
as Jesus just dying for our sins. And that substitutionary way of thinking about God's work of Jesus on the cross is born in a certain metaphor. That way of talking about Easter is born in kind of a certain way of looking at the gospel. Number one, God has been deeply offended by human sin and now demands punishment. Two, Unfortunately, the sin is so great and God is so deeply offended and humanity is so deeply flawed that nothing we human beings can do could possibly atone for this great offense. And the only punishment harsh enough is death. Three, again, this metaphor that understands Easter in this one way. Three, since we are unworthy or incapable of doing anything about our sin, God has to come to us in the person of Jesus to suffer and to die on our behalf as a substitute, as a ransom for our brokenness. And finally, for with God's wrath now satisfied on Easter Sunday, we can accept what Jesus has done, believe in, in our hearts, and then restored to a right relationship with God. That's the metaphor. That's the story behind an understanding of Jesus being our substitute, paying the price for our sins, and rising on Easter Sunday. Now, it is a great story. As I said in Sunday school today, it is a wonderful story. Many of us can recite it in our sleep. This morning, I don't want to debate it. But what I do want to make clear is that this is only one way of talking about the events of Holy Week. And it is not at all the way Mark understands the events of Holy Week. That's where we've been over the past few weeks. And right on up through Easter Sunday, we are going to stay in the Gospel of Mark. And this is not how Mark understands the story of the Last Supper or Easter Sunday at all. Even though that's the way the church has understood it for a thousand years, it is not the only way to tell the story. In fact, for the first thousand years of Christianity, it's not the way the story was told at all. This way of telling the story, the way that most of us grew up with, it's a great one if your view of God is primary that of a judge, which again is a valid way of thinking about God, but it's not the only way to think about God. You see, if your image of God if your image of God is more like, like Abba, Father, Daddy, if your image of God is more like a parent, then this story actually makes no sense at all. In fact, I would contend that if your image of God is like the Abba, Father that Jesus talks about, then the story just doesn't break down it becomes completely irrelevant. Because for most parents, there is absolutely nothing our children could do to make forgiveness impossible. In fact, one might fairly ask whether or not really is forgiveness at all if there's this overriding need for punishment. Think about that. What could your child do? What could you have done to your parent, your mother, your father, that would make forgiveness impossible? Or, or to make you think that somehow suffering was needed in order for you to be forgiven. Think of the suffering that is so often part of the Easter story. If you saw Mel Gibson's movie several years ago, The Passion of the Christ, or, or for that matter, any movie, any movie that portrays the crucifixion of Jesus, they'll probably be on in a couple weeks. The Easter weekend, they're everywhere. 
If you watch any of those films, you know the importance of the suffering of Jesus. God didn't just need to to have Jesus die for our sin. He also needed to suffer, and thus death on the cross. But friends, thinking of God in that manner, it has me, and frankly, I think should have many of us asking, what kind of God is that? What kind of God are we really calling people to love and to serve? For even in the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the pigeons, the doves, the lambs, they were never made to suffer because of some sin that might have been placed on them. What kind of God would demand not only death for the punishment of sin, but suffering as well? Where did that story come? from and why is it the only one we ever hear and tell with that kind of view of God is it any wonder that for hundreds perhaps thousands of years people have done terrible things in the name of God If that is the picture we have of divine action, is it any wonder that we can then justify that same violence in our own lives, in our own world? The answer, according to Mark, is that's not the only picture. Mark makes it clear that's not the only way to understand the story. Beginning with the Last Supper, Jesus' death is about participation, not substitution. We're called to do this in remembrance of Him. Because our remembering empowers us to live as He did. That's what the Maundy in Maundy Thursday is all about. The word comes from the Latin mandatum, which means mandate. What is the mandate? Do this in remembrance of me. The mandate of Jesus was and remains to remember and to live our lives in that memory. And therein lies the power of the table. When we remember, when we remember what he did, We are empowered to participate in the work of God in the world today. That's, I think, the first point of Thursday. But there's a second one at well. And it's one I I think some of you have talked about in your Wednesday evening Lenten study groups. And it has to do with the people who are at the table. How many people are at that last supper? How many? Thirteen, right? Twelve disciples plus Jesus. They're all there. All of them are there. The people who are given the power of the table, if you will, are all twelve of Jesus' disciples. You see, much to the surprise of many of us, God's power, it's not just given to an elite few, to those who we would designate as the really faithful ones, certainly not betrayers, not deniers at all. Only a certain group would be given this power of God at the table, right? Not so at least not according to Mark. Think about what that means for us today. I'm always stunned at some of the discussions I hear about communion in the Presbyterian Church, and really in many different Christian traditions. Have you heard the term fencing the table before? Fencing the table. It is is still remarkably common today People believing that the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is reserved only for a certain group of people. 
Only those who believe or think a certain way. Only those who have been deemed to be correct in their understanding of faith and God. The orthodox understanding of the Bible. Those are the only people welcomed at the table of Jesus. Everyone else is fenced away. Think about that. Think about that in light of the people who were with Jesus at the Last Supper. Apparently, at least from all the stories we've been told, both Peter and Judas were still there. And Jesus knew what what lied ahead. He knew that Peter would disown him three times before the rooster crowed. He knew that Judas would betray him, and with a kiss, nonetheless, sitting at table with him were two men who, after living with Jesus for more than a year, perhaps as many as three, They didn't quite get what he was all about. Peter wasn't going to allow his friend to be put to death. He couldn't grasp the whole concept of giving up life in order to find it. Nor was he completely comfortable with the whole concept of sacrificial love. It didn't make sense to him. And he denied knowing this Jesus. And Judas... Judas was so caught up in the domination system of Rome that he still believed power and political victory were the only way to win. The denials, the betrayals of these two men were the first nails striking deep into the heart of Jesus. And Scripture does not lead us to believe in any way that this was a surprise to Jesus. He knew it was coming, and yet he sat at table with them. He washed their feet. He broke bread. He drank from the same cup. With two men who not only didn't get it, but who clearly resisted in outward ways. So when I hear of people fencing the table, when I hear about anyone who would in any way attempt to guard the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, reserving it for some, denying it to anyone, all because we think we know who is worthy and who is not, I get a little irritated by that. Because to me, it doesn't reflect the way of Jesus. Jesus was and remains an all-are-welcome host. You know those no shirts, no shoes, no service signs that you see? All over the beach towns? There's nothing like that around the table of the Lord. Everyone, everyone is welcome at God's table. And Mark's telling of the story of that last Passover in the 14th chapter of his gospel reveals that. When 1 Corinthians 11 says that no one should eat the bread or drink of the cup in an unworthy manner, let's be clear, that is a challenge given not to us, as a corporate body, but to us as individuals. We are called not to eat or drink in an unworthy manner, not to make judgments against anyone else. I don't know where you all are in your walk with God. I don't know how Jesus is speaking into your life today. I don't know how the Spirit is leading you on your journey to the cross this Lenten season. So to do anything that might deny you an experience that might truly bring you into the power of Christ experienced at the table, friends, that would be the height of arrogance. Some decisions 
are our own decisions. And none of us dare tell another that they can't or that they must not make the same decision that we have made. Unless you think that's not a significant point. Please hear me when I say that this is not as trite or as trivial as denominations disagreeing about whether or not people should be baptized by sprinkling or full immersion. Those are trite arguments. Any practices of the church or any faith community that limits its practices to only certain people, cutting out the Peters and the Judases of the world, they miss the central component of the gospel, at least as we see in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark 14. The message of Thursday is all about the power of God given to the people at the table. The power of God that calls us, that beckons us, perhaps pleads with us to participate in the work that God is seeking to do in the world. And it's for all of us, for all people, Anyone seeking to go deeper in their journey with the divine. So as your Lenten journey continues, as you continue to walk with Jesus toward the cross, consider the power that God has put within you. Consider how you're using it. Consider how you're linking arms with the people who are around you, the people that you sit with here every Sunday. And then, like deer, panting for streams of living water, let's journey together with, in, and for the one we name. God, one of the great hymns of our faith calls upon you to tune our hearts that we might sing your praise. God, this morning, tune our hearts that we might live your ways. You've empowered us. Month after month, we celebrate when we gather around the table. So set us to work as your people in this world, that your kingdom might indeed come again and again and again. For the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Would our ushers please come forward to receive the offer? <laughs>
excuse me, before we leave, as always, let's take a few moments and lift up our joys and concerns, make our prayers as a corporate family to, to God. What would you like to lift up today? Okay. Becky, who's part of Agape, um, is going to be having surgery this week and would love some visitors. So if you are at Alexandria Hospital, CK, if you need more details, but we will certainly remember her in our prayers today. Bajuni. Russell was on kind of like a backpacking ministry out west with, um, with friends, so we want to give thanks for his safe return home. And um, Beach Project, was it who, who from, who's at UVA? G Priscilla? Esther, yeah. She was doing some kind of beach ministry down in uh, Florida, which is a wonderful place to do ministry uh, over <laughs> spring break. So we want to remember Esther, and when you see her, just make sure she, she knows that you were thinking of her. Did I see another hand? Yeah, Jean? So you've connected. So I have to call to find out when they move and they have to find And what tell tell us her name. Nancy. Your sister's name. Nancy. Nancy. We will remember um, Louise's sister Nancy and her family and just pray that God would be very near to her during these challenging days. Anybody else? Continue to pray for uh, Betty Vosbeck, who went home this week and is recuperating there. We'll pray for her nurse, her nurses, <laughs> you and your dad. All right, gracious God. Change us. Continue to make us more and more like Christ so that in all of these situations, we might be light. We might be salt. Use us so that we might bring hope to those who maybe are just feeling a little hopeless these days. God, use us to, to bring strength to those who are perhaps a little weary or tired. God, we bring all of these people and situations into the light of your presence this morning. Use us. God, use us so that we might bring healing and wholeness by the power of your Holy Spirit and for the sake of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Please stand for our closing hymn. Friends, as you go forth from this place, hope loud, dream big, and dare to imagine. And may the amazing grace and perfect love of God fill you and surround you today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.